I'm Susan Watkins. I'm the Director of the Centre for Culture and the Arts at Leeds Beckett University. I'd like to welcome you all to the second in our series of Leeds Cultural Conversations. The Centre has organised this series in partnership with Leeds City Council and it's also supported by the publisher Palgrave Macmillan. We're working closely with Palgrave on their campaign for the humanities. For more information about the following talks in the series, please visit our website and you'll also find postcards advertising other forthcoming centre events that might interest you on the table outside. Just to give you a couple of details about soon-to-be-happening events, on the 16th to the 17th of October we have our Thinking Dance, Questioning the Contemporary conference, and on the 6th of November we have our Post-Capitalism 2015 Rethinking Crisis, <coughs> Culture and Politics conference, uh, with Paul Mason from Channel 4. So please do have a look at those events if any of them interest you. Um, these talks are being filmed and there will be plenty of time for questions afterwards. So after Emily has uh, given her talk, I'll chair um, some questions afterwards. So today I'm really delighted to introduce Dr oh. Emily Marshall, who is Senior Lecturer in Postcolonial Literature in the School of Cultural Studies at Leeds Beckett University. Emily's research is focused on race, racial politics, and Caribbean carnival cultures. She's particularly interested in forms of cultural resistance and cross-cultural fertilization in the face of colonialism. She is an expert in the role of trickster figures, such as Anansi the Spider and Br'er Rabbit, in the literatures and cultures of Africa and its diaspora. Her book, Anansi's Journey, a story of Jamaican cultural resistance was published by the University of the West Indies Press in 2012, and she's currently writing her next book, which is about the figure of Br'er Rabbit in African American literature. We're really pleased to have this event as part of our Black History Month celebrations, and we're also looking ahead to the 50th anniversary of Leeds West Indian Carnival in 2017, which the centre will be marking with an international conference on the topic of carnival. So today, Emily will, will be speaking to us on the topic of It's Not All Sequins in Bikinis, Power, Performance and Play in the Leeds and Trinidad Carnival. Thanks, Emily. Thank Hello and welcome, and uh, thank you all for making it on such a gloomy day. I and mean, what better way to spend a gloomy afternoon but spend, have an hour of thinking and talking about carnival. So, um, the Midnight Robber, in his black sombrero ador hat adorned with skulls, and um, of, he often wears coffin-shaped shoes, is a mysterious masquerade character from the Trinidad Carnival. And he exemplifies many practices that were central to Caribbean culture. Resistance to officialdom, linguistic innovation, and also the disruptive nature of parody, play, and humor. This is a, an image of the midnight robber here. Today, however, the midnight robber is rarely found in the carnival procession. Um, and nor are many of the traditional masquerade characters, which were often used to criticize and to challenge authoritarian power. Now, there are two main criticisms leveled at uh, the contemporary Caribbean carnival. Um, A, that it's become too commercialized, and B, that it's all about sequins, boobs, bottoms, and bikinis, a spectacle of female flesh for the male gaze. So I'm going to be asking today, to what extent contemporary carnival practices in Leeds and Trinidad continue to provide a challenge to officialdom, or do they paradoxically reinstate the rules of patriarchy and capitalism? Firstly, though, I want to tell you some of the reasons that I'm interested um, in carnival, and also, in particular, um, the character of the Midnight Robber. So for, for over a decade now, I've been researching um, Caribbean folk tales, and in particular, as Susan said, the trickster figure. So this is my book, Anansi's Journey, which started off as a PhD project. And um, I was absolutely fascinated by the journey of the, the trickster folk tales Anansi from West Africa to the Caribbean. 
Um, and what I decided to look at was the ways in which the folk tales form a type of psychological resistance to colonial oppression and slavery. Um, I was lucky enough to spend three months in the Caribbean uh, interviewing folk, folk, um, folklorists, interviewing you know, taxi drivers, uh, um, people in the, the maroon villages. Everybody had an Anansi story to tell. It was amazing how, um, how the Anansi stories were still so relevant in the contemporary Caribbean. And um, this is one of the men I met here. He's a maroon abeng blower. So the, the abeng... Um, is a, a sacred instrument which can only be blown by certain members of uh, the Maroon clan. The Maroons were escaped slaves um, that, that, that escaped from the plantations and gained, uh, lived uh, autonomously from British control for, for, for many years. Um, so the Maroons, I found, which I, I thought was absolutely fascinating, actually had a Nancy stories that were even more similar to their African counterparts than Anansi stories outside the Maroon community. So in a sense, that West African culture had been preserved in the Maroon community in a way that you couldn't find it elsewhere. So the Anansi stories were, were the West African Anansi stories. Um, and these are, these are some uh, pictures of Anansi. Uh, this is uh, one of the first uh, written versions of the Anansi stories uh, in Ghana by... Um, uh, a, a colonial folklorist called Rattray, um, but he asked Ghanaian children to illustrate the story. So this is Anansi putting beans in his hat and Anansi catching hold of his hat. Anansi is a trickster. He's, uh, he, 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 he injects chaos, disruption, um, anarchy into well-ordered structures of society. Um, and what I argued in my book is that the term resistance correctly describes the practices of defiant, ex defiance executed by both the mind and the body. So what I argued is that the plantation slaves that resistant at a psychological level, exemplified in folklore, influence practical resistance. So that psychological resistance influence pra practical physical tactics of resistance. So on the plantations, this could be uh, poisoning, breaking machinery, working slowly, theft. And these are all the sorts of things that Anansi does um, in, in the stories. So those, so those stories would inspire that type of uh, physical tactics of resistance, um, which in turn contributed to rebellion and resistances aimed at overthrowing the plantation power structures. Now, traditional Caribbean cultural forms, such as folklore and carnival traditions, have been shaped by their ability to provide a psychological outlet to the Caribbean people, both on the plantations and during the post-emancipation period. Um, yet the carnival um, has had, and still does, a very ambivalent relationship to power, which I'm going to explain with the help of Russian theorist Mikhail Bakhtin. This is Bakhtin here. Now, Bakhtin's theories of the carnivalesque are central to any critical analysis of carnival. Bakhtin actually focuses on the hierarchical Middle Ages in Europe and Russia, but his ideas are very relevant in our analysis of Caribbean carnival. During the Middle Ages, the carnival played a key role in the lives of the ordinary people, as it gave them a chance to thwart strict social rules and turn officialdom, which is the authority of the church and the feudal system, on its head through role reversals, through parody, through song, through dance, and also through laughter. Bakhtin describes the phenomenon of carnival as an ambivalent spectacle that involved both the actor and the spectator in a parody of authoritarian structures. But he says that much was permissible in the form of laughter that was impermissible in serious form. So the carnival in the Middle Ages, like the Caribbean carnival, was ut utilised as a coping mechanism um, for people living in hierarchical societies. And it cel celebrated this reversal of oppressive structures. However, 
Richard Sheshner argues in Carnival Theory after Bakhtin. So he's sort of looked at this Carnival Theory of Bakhtin and revised it. And he says that although aspects of Bakhtin's ideas are applicable to an analysis of Caribbean Carnival, um, especially the Trinidadian Carnival in its early form, he, he says that the Caribbean is now a post-colonial democracy, not a feudal society in the Middle Ages. So he wonders um, at what oppressive forces the contemporary carnival is now staged. Um, he explains that although it might be a temporary relief from the authority imposed in the name of democracy, it is better described as a cultural form which simultaneously critiques official culture and supports it. So it's a cultural form that critiques and supports official culture. So um, it could be argued that Carnival both critiques and supports officialdom, but is always an event full of the threat of the breakdown of structure. So it's the threat is there, the threat of violence, the threat of rioting, the threat of chaos. But it remains a threat, um, and it's not open revolt or revolution. And this slide here shows a sort of bacchanalian fun of carnival. Um, it's an image from the London Illustrated News in 1888. So we have the jester, we have dancing on the streets, um, we have characters dressed up in this devilish costumes. Um, so many scholars support this interpretation of carnival, and they say by testing the boundaries of society, what carnival does is it simultaneously reaffirms the social orders that govern a society. And in, if we think of carnival in that way, then carnival is a kind of pressure valve for the community, since it offers a temporary release, um, like a sort of pressure cooker. It lets people let off steam, you know, vent their, their frustrations and anger and channel them into other you know, creative forms. Oh, sorry. Um, this, is, this is a carnival. Uh, this is one of the very early carnivals um, in the 1600s, carnival with masked figures. So again, you know, we get this scene of, of, of revelry and, and of bacchanalian excess. Um, so as well as the West African and Indian cultural influences, Caribbean carnival has its roots in the Italian carnival tradition, uh, which began in the 1200s, where Italian Catholics held a festival they called Carnival, which meant to put away the meat or a farewell to flesh. Um, and it was basically this, the, 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 this time of fun and excess before following the, the strict dietary and behavioural rules imposed by Lent. And the practice spread uh, to other Catholic countries in Europe. Um, in Trinidad, French planters came um, from the islands of Haiti, Guadeloupe, and Martinique. They, were, they came to Trinidad because they feared the effects of the French Revolution um, in 1789. And so these planters came to Trinidad and they brought with them their own slaves, they brought with them their own customs and their culture. And the upper and middle classes held balls that, uh, to celebrate Carnival. And they actually often mimicked and ridiculed the dress and behavior of the lower classes and the slaves in these balls. And the tradition took root, and then it continued to be celebrated under the British, who captured the island in, 17, uh, in 1797. Now, the slaves were banned from these balls, but they held their own dances and celebrations, and they drew from their African traditions. Um, and they, too, mocked the planters, the masters, in their behavior and their dress. So there's this sort of fantastic role reversal going on, you know, in terms of the masters' balls and the slaves' carnival. After emancipation um, in 1839, newly liberated slaves merged their celebrations with a ritual known as can brûlé, or cambule. Cambule is the burning of the cane fields. In French, it means to burn the cane fields. Um, so it's based on a reenactment of burning the, the cane fields. So it was very much an, act, uh, 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 um, an event you know, full of resistance and defiance, but it was also a part of the harvest festival as well. And, um, and during this, during uh, Cambule, um, Stick fighting, or, or kalinda, was commonly practiced, that we can see on the slides here. Um, Cambule celebrations 
took place two days before Ash Wednesday, which is the first day of Lent. And it became even bigger than Europeans balls and evolved into major street carnivals um, with singing, dancing, drumming and lighted torches. The French Creoles and the, and the British uh, disapproved of Cambrouillet and efforts were made to stop the, priest, uh, the, stop the, the street processions. Um, now, uh, in a play that was published in the Trinidad Spectator in 1847, um, we have a character, Mr. Carthman. Um, he's a merchant from the port of Spain in Trinidad. And his ideas really reflect the kind of, um, the ideas of his class um, in terms of the, the carnival um, or cambulet. So this is from the play, What's Good for the Gander is Good for the Goose. You tell me those are rational beings with human faces who indulge themselves in such scandalous debauchery. Do you know anything more absurd than these disgusting masquerades of the most backward times, more stupid than this Trinidad carnival? And attempts were made by the British administration to prevent the Cambolet revellers, which led to a riot to in 1881. Um, however, you know, as with all these, 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 these um, cultural forms, they metamorphosize, they change into different forms. And so Cambrouillet metamorphosized into a wild and raucous Jamet. It was called the Jamet Street Carnival. And the Jamet Street Carnival is called Jamet because it was thought to be um, participate. It was thought to be based on um, on participants who are thought to be below the diameter of respectability. So Jamet, as in diameter. Throughout the 20th century, and in particular after independence from Great Britain in, six, in 1962, Carnival grew to become one of the great markers of Trinidadian identity, and it was it become a huge national celebration. So nowadays, before Carnival, um, you know, the whole the whole country holds its breath. Um, you know, there's this sense of you know, extreme anticipation, and this is wonderfully. Um, summed up in, um, in uh, Carnival by Robert Antoni. Robert Antoni is actually coming to Leeds on Friday to give a talk. I'll tell you more about that at the end. Um, actually, Robert Antoni describes this feeling before Carnival um, as nearly one, you know, a, a one of foreboding. It's nearly a sort of a frightening event. And he says that although uh, Trinidad um, escapes because of its position in the Gulf Stream, escapes um, Hurricanes. There is this human hurricane that occurs every year in on the island. Um, on this West Indian island, we board up once a year for a human hurricane. In the cool air, you could feel the lull before the storm, the sudden stillness. Yet, in the apparent vacuum, you felt an electrical charge, foreboding some catastrophic atmosp atmospheric event was about to take place. Even the birds were quiet. They knew. The pot cakes up in the surrounding hills. An eerie silence. So today, Trinidadian carnival um, celebrations last for over a month. Um, um, and the performance of contemporary carnival in Trinidad still retains part of its past political um, satire involving a parody and mockery of the establishment. In particular, this takes place in Calypso songs, um, which is based on African call and response traditions. But uh, the Calypsos create a platform for political satire where people can sing about the corrupt politicians and, and draw attention to their wrongdoings um, Um, so um, there is that element of play that goes on, and play, um, in many ways, destabilizes power with its random, unstructured nature. You know, whether this is found in storytelling, in carnival, in calypso, in theatre, you know, a play, or in a school playground, play involves mimicking and masking. It involves disguise, tricking, role reversal. Um, uh, yet there is this fascinating paradox at the heart of Trinidad Carnival, uh, which is actually also mirrored in the Leeds Carnival traditions. So although it's often perceived as this celebration of thwarting the norms and the transcendence from governing forces, there is also this very strict code of conduct to adhere to. 
in terms of the proceedings and especially the main procession. So the costumes, the songs and the dances are all carefully structured. There's the kings and queens followed by the nobles. Rank and file in the main procession dominates every aspect. Um, and this is a, a fabulous uh, picture of the carnival queen, this year's carnival queen in Trinidad. Um, so that every year they hold a competition for the carnival king and queen, just as they do in Leeds. And this, um, the sweet waters of Africa, uh, she was crowned carnival queen um, this year. So the rigid structures of, um, of, of the procession contrast dramatically with a celebration called Juve. And Juve is what you might argue the ultimate expression of liberation. It comes from the French jour ouvert, so the breaking of the day or open day. Um, and it's also practiced at Leeds West Indian Carnival. Um, this is, this is uh, Juve here in Leeds. These are blue devils. These are traditional masquerade characters here. Um, and this is a, a, a fabulous... Um, image from uh, for Juve morning in the in the port in Port of Spain. I just think it really expresses that that sort of moment of transcendence of freedom. So in in Leeds, Juve revelers take to the streets in their pajamas or in traditional costumes like the Blue Devils. And in Trinidad, Juve revelers take things uh, one step further. So they dance all night. They cover themselves in mud or paint or grease until the breaking of the dawn. And it's a a ritual symbolic of of renewal, of regeneration, of rebirth. You know, it's a process of transformation um, in which the participants, in many ways, transcend their human form, you know, so by covering themselves in mud and grease and, and paint, um, they, they become unrecognizable and they enter what you might call a liminal zone, you know, betwixt and between zone, where transformation occurs. And everyone can take part in Juve. It is truly democratic. There's no expensive costumes to buy. There's no order to follow. There's no rank and file. Despite that freedom that Juve offers, um, since independence, Trinidad Carnival has become increasingly commercialised. And this is, um, this is a, a, a brochure advertising Trinidad Carnival. Uh, a lot of um, uh, uh, diasporic Americans and Indians of Caribbean origin travel to, to Trinidad uh, to take part in the carnival celebrations. So it's a big tourist attraction. It brings in a huge amount of money for the island. Um, it's endorsed and sponsored by the establishment, and in many ways, it's seeped in consumerism. So the, expen the costumes are expensive to buy. Um, unlike the, you know, what, you need put on, what you need for Jouvet. Uh, so um, there's a huge amount of waste as well. So once these expensive costumes are bought, they're often thrown away uh, just uh, discarded. So there's, there's, a, there's a great deal of, of waste. Um, and the theatre carnival practitioner Colin Prescott points out there may be a danger that capitalism will spiral the carnival out of the control of the people. However, Leeds West Indian Carnival is very much in the control of the people. So established in 1967, it boasts to be the first Caribbean-style street carnival in Europe, um, run by Caribbean people. And it's found at Arthur France, who's sitting over there, um, from St. Kitts, um, has enjoyed a very good relationship with Leeds City Council and with other civic institutions. Um, and it's run by a, a carnival committee, a very dedicated group of local people, predominantly of Caribbean origin, who have shaped carnival since its beginnings. Um, so here we have, this is a, a, a wonderful photo of the carnival committee in 1974. Um, Vince Wilkinson, Hugh Bon Condor, Hebrew Rawlins, Arthur France, Kathleen Brown, and George Archibald. And here, founders of the Le Le Leeds West Indian Carnival, we have Ian Charles and Arthur, Arthur France. So there's only been one year where there was serious trouble at Leeds Carnival in 1990 when two people were shot. And this is referred to by the committee as this Annus Horribilis. And every other year has been celebrated relatively peacefully and joyfully. Um, the Leeds West Indian Carnival follows 
a very similar format to Trinidad Carnival, but it's held in August because it's too bloody cold to take to the streets um, in, uh, in, 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 for the Easter celebrations. Um, at the Car Carnival Symposium we held at Leeds Beckett last year, Arthur France talked about the struggles that he had in convincing people um, to celebrate a uh, Leeds West Indian Carnival. Um, and, you know, he, it was incredible, the feat, the incredible what he pulled off. Um, he described having to buy chickens from Leeds Market and pull out the feathers to make carnival costumes because there was nowhere that you could buy packs of feathers. Um, people's houses were turned into mass camps where they, they made outfits you know, all night long. So it's really the community joined together to make carnival happen. They had to beg and borrow costume materials. They had to convince the police and Leeds City Council that it would be a worthwhile affair. Um, but then on August bank holiday 1967, the sound of steel pan filled the air and the first Caribbean street carnival uh, in Europe was ready to take to the streets. And Arthur states that he decided it would be run by West Indians full stop. We were always labelled as not being capable of running things. We proved them wrong. So to return to the theme of resistance, is Leeds Carnival a challenge to authoritarian power? In many ways, it's not. It's a very orderly and respectable affair. Yet a political vein has run through many of the mass performances um, and political satire has long been used um, to highlight issues which are central to the people. The troop Harrison Bundy, I'm a bit biased because it's a troop that I also take part in, um, but the troop Harrison Bundy is sponsored by a Chapel Town law firm. Um, it's very much, the law firm is very much rooted in the community. It deals with personal legal matters such as criminal law, family matters, immigration, actions against the police. So Harrison Bundy uh, sponsored a troop, a troop which every year um, has had a, you know, a, a political message. So I've got a list of the, of the different, um, the different types of causes that Harrison Bundy has lent its name to. So we've got, um, in 2008, uh, Freedom, which was closed Guantanamo. Uh, and the police actually stopped the troop entering the park, saying that it was too political, so they weren't actually allowed to enter into the, into the park. Um, 2009, eco-warriors with costumes made uh, with recycled plastic waste and shopping bags. 2010, shame on you, BP. Um, um, after the Gulf oil spill, we had the Arab Spring then, and we used the colours, Blood a Go Run, Save the NHS, which had a great crowd reception. And then 2013, Unstitch the Rich um, and the Midnight Rubber. Um, and 2014, World Soccer, World, World Soccer, so Soccer, Soccer, I Love Football But Hate FIFA. And two, 2005, this year, was Mama Dred's Migrant Masqueraders, which is a much more traditional mass outfit. Um, um, so uh, here's some of the pictures. So this is the Harrison Bundy troop. Save the NHS, Blood A Go Run. This is, this is, the, um, this is uh, the Unstitch the Rich. We've got the Midnight Robber there. Did you mention me pension? And that, <laughs> right. That's me there. <laughs> um, so, and we've got some more. This is the Harrison Pundy troop and Stitch the Ridge, Axe the Bedroom Tax, um, and, uh, and, for, and, and other sort of political slogans. Um, so some of us were dressed up like the rich and some of us dressed up as the, as the poor in this, in this particular troop. So I want to suggest, though, as well as parodying political figures, one of the ways that Carnival um, can revive and retain its elements of mockery, parody, and humor is, um, is to also revisit traditional mass characters. I'm going to tell you a little bit about traditional mass characters. Um, now, traditional mass um, is played by characters which all have a very specific role in terms of speech, dress, and behavior. And each character um, is often focused on challenging and resisting officialdom and also highlighting community issues. Um, mass characters have become less visible in the late 20th, 20th and 21st century. Um, but 
But before that, people, they actually became these masked characters. When you played a particular masked character, like the Midnight Robber, you know, this was something that actually you lived with all year. You know, you, you became, that character became a part of, of who you are. Um, and the idio idiosyncrasies of the characters stayed with the performers all year round. Um, so there's a whole, I mean, I'm not going to go into them all because we haven't got time, but there's so many fascinating traditional characters. For example, there's um, Jab Molassi, um, and, and he is a character which is he's covered in, in molasses, covered in brown paint, and he's meant to represent the ghost of a slave fallen into molasses. There's Moko Jambe here. Uh, from Trinidad, and these are uh, signs of, you know, that, that, that direct um, uh, transmission of West African culture into Trinidad. So uh, the Moko Jumbo are on high stilts, um, like West African stilt dancers. Uh, we have a, a, a character called Baby Doll, who's quite an, a scary character, I think. She, she has a little, she has a, a, baby, a baby doll in her arms that she thrusts the doll at people in the crowd. And, uh, and, and then if you don't take the doll, then she says, you know, what am I going to do with the baby? What am I going to do with the baby? So that's Baby Doll. There's Dame Lorraine, who's a parody of the French upper classes. Um, so she's an upper class lady dressed in, in fake finery and rags, and she behaves terribly. And often she's pregnant, and, and she, yeah, she's sort of you know, a parody of that you know, upper class respectability. Um, and then, uh, very, these, these are fascinating characters. These are minstrels in Trinidad, but they're minstrels which paint their faces white. So they're played by uh, black characters who paint their faces white in a, in a, you know, to, uh, in a parody of um, American minstrel traditions. Now, the midnight robber, the mid this is a, these are images of the midnight robber who has made an appearance in Leeds Carnival, uh, in Harrison Bundy Troop. So there's the Midnight Robber. Um, so he's considered one of the most fearsome and dangerous of all the mass characters. Um, so he has this great big sombrero hat. Often his shoes are shaped like coffins. And he first makes his appearance at the turn of the century in carnival bands of 30 or 40 people. And he has this, this robber talk. Um, and it's this unique blend of Creole and standard English. And what he'll do is he'll stop members of the crowd um, and he'll perform a speech and if the speech is good then they give him money so it's a sort of economic <coughs> exchange so it's a character based on linguistic skill um, so like a Nancy the, 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 the midnight robber has to be a master of oratory he uses his linguistic skill to turn a table on his oppressors and what's fascinating is that some of these midnight robbers, some of these men who played the midnight robber, they would have several speeches, um, long speeches that they would memorize. And those speeches were handed down from one midnight robber to the other. So very rep much reminiscent of the West African griot tradition where you know, history is recorded in oral form and passed down throughout the generations. And the speeches themselves are wonderful. Um, an example of one of the speeches is, I am a cyclone in human form, hell-bent on revenge. Um, at the age of three, I drowned my mother Cecilia in a spoon of water. <laughs> so so they're, full of, they're full of humor, um, but also this kind of potent uh, uh, you know, revenge. Um, and they also highlight the plight of the poor. I am the tireless clarion of the world. I cry mankind's joys and sorrows every hour. Whenever I speak, a million people listen to my voice. The Latin, the Celt, the Hun, the Muslim, the Hindu, all comprehend me. Now, I want to play, if I manage to, uh, to do this correctly, um, just a, a part here. This, now, this is, a, this is a man who's been playing the midnight robber, Esau, uh, for many years, and he talks um, briefly here about um, his outfit and what being a robber meant to him. So it's John Bimbos, it had a different, different places that different persons was in the band, but the band was belongs to John John. Okay, okay. This, the speech I had made, that was in my first coming out. You understand? This midnight robber that speech. speech. I could remember that good. That my speechless voice, because I'm young, you know, yeah. carry terror arms. 
which I, Clementine, and doom the city of great kings. Here I became this criminal of all, with my instrument can take you flying, running, and trying to make a master get away from death. But it's no time to escape from my cruel doings. I had hidden my great grandfather and I take his blood to quench my thirst. I grind his bone and make powder for my revolver. His flesh I give to the wild beast in the desert. Sorry. And then I crumble and there I remain a notorious killer and the greatest robber on the face of the earth. <laughs> very good, very good, Mr. Millington. Very, very that is good. my first coming. That is, that is when I was about 16 years old, and now I'm 99, 99, or 90. So I still remember it. Was, yeah, that was the first. Yeah, I could remember that. So that was my first speech. The only speech that I had. Yes, it was black bag and satin mm -hmm. with a very, a very, um, wrong size hat. Mm -hmm. The hat was in black and white. Mm -hmm. There was no arm, mm -hmm. no crown on it. It was just a shaped hat, shaped in a four points. Mm -hmm. Four points with a big rim, mm -hmm. with the black and white dots mm -hmm. on it, as a Mexican. A Mexican? Yes, as a Mexican. Mm -hmm. And then was the pants mm -hmm. was bad, Dyed in black, strung out and dyed in black. The shirt was black satin. Black satin shirts. That is how I come up play in the bag and satin. Okay. So I love the fact that he is 90 something. Let <laughs> <laughs> me just. Uh... Okay, so. Um, now, I want to throw um, a little bit of a curveball um, uh, in this final part of my presentation. Now, while the Midnight Robber and traditional mass uh, characters might offer a return uh, to a tradition which critiques official culture and keeps African cultural forms alive, they're also embedded in an extremely patriarchal tradition. So during Carnival, women um, do not play the role of midnight robber, um, and most mass characters predominantly demonstrate the anti-authoritarian power and prowess of black men. Now, as I highlighted, the criticism leveled at contemporary Trinidadian Carnival is that there's too, much, too many bikinis, too much flesh, in particular female flesh on display. Women, media headline and scream, have taken over Carnival and they are flaunting themselves wantonly on the streets, playing mass with bacchanalian energy and putting their sexuality on show in vulgar displays um, uh, of dancing with skimpy costumes. Uh, so this is for an example from a recent article um, published this year um, in the Trinidad Guardian. And the title of the article is Women, Women Just as Culpable for Demeaning Themselves. Um, so the Catholic spokesman Vernon Kalawan asks, what is the message women send to younger people, including their own children? Is it acceptable to parade on the streets on carnival days wearing only bikinis and sometimes a bra with only beads and feathers for cover, prancing and gyrating, and so many times making sure the TV car cameras pick up on the contortions through which they put their bodies? Um, now, by contrast, in an excellent article um, about the notions of the flesh in Caribbean carnival, Anna Perkins argues that Caribbean women have subverted and continue to subvert negative interpretations of the female body, in particular those found in Christian traditions of Lent, which she argues 
those Christian t traditions devalue the physical being and oftentimes view it as a site of sinfulness and temptation. So she believes that women's role in the contemporary carnival masquerade revalues bodies, especially the colonized female body. In Trinidad, she continues, the negative responses to what is now called skin mass because of the, the amount of, 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 of flesh on display, um, it's actually a negative reaction, she says, to men, by men to women taking over mass, I quote, setting the pace and no longer being content to remain in the shadows playing adjunct to men. So in this sense, this, the mass of sequins and bikinis is in fact a progressive one. You know, is it a revolutionary one? I don't know. It is a progressive one which celebrates the female body in public through bodily transgressions and it assaults the conservative notions of a woman's proper place, notions which are grounded in traditional interpretations of religious faith. Uh, during slavery, the black female body was the site of violence, ownership, and reproduction. But today, daughters, mothers, grandmothers dance wildly on the streets in revealing clothing, and this challenges the construction of the black female body as property, as a symbol of Christian virtue, or as mother and childbearer. So through their transgressive acts, they reclaim the agency of their disciplined and devalued bodies. Um, and this is a, a fantastic picture of the burlesque troupe this year at Leeds West Indian Carnival. Um, so Carnival is multifaceted. Um, and it's also full of opposing forces. I'm afraid I'm going to throw up more questions than I am going to answer them. Um, this spectacle um, also simultaneously reinforces the patri patriarchal stereotypes many women wish to critique. So uh, it undeniably gives some strength to the image of the overtly sexualized woman on display for the male gaze. However, carnival will always hold up a magic mirror to society, reflecting and critiquing its problems, highlighting its tensions and paradoxes. And as such, it will always remain profoundly ambivalent, complex and contradictory. So until we move, or well, until we transgress completely the rules imposed by patriarchy, Carnival will continue to reflect emancipatory acts by women while still highlighting the limitations of their emancipation. And I want to end with this image here, um, the burlesque troupe, which I think really you know, demonstrates that sort of, you know, that, that, the joy, the freedom of carnival. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> we could uh, put, throw it open to the floor for any comments or questions for Andrew. <laughs> She's hiding. <Yeah. laughs> Anyone like to start us off with any questions? Yes. Um, Emily, could you tell us something about the racial makeup of the Trinidad Carnival? Um, Do Indians, for example, take part? Yes, Just absolutely. As as, yes. Are racial tensions between the two communities ever manifested in? Well, in um, I have. I don't have. Perhaps uh, there's probably some here people here who might, you know, have have further answer to that. Um, the Trinidadian carnival is very much uh, influenced by Indian culture, and um, what's wonderful is that this fusion that's taken place between. Yeah you know, African, Indian, European, and even Amerindian cultural forms uh, in the carnival. Um, and I, I, so it's, 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 it, it seems that it's actually, a, you know, a harmonious fusion where, um, for example, um, one of the, 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 the hits um, last year, I think it was, one of the carnival hits was uh, based on Indian rhythms and singing. So you have, uh, you know, calypso rhythms alongside the Indian rhythms. So, so there's this, there's this, you know, this, this the multifaceted uh, celebration of different cultures, you know, which, which is a reflection of Trinidad <coughs> itself. Now, I don't know if anyone wants to comment further. I'm looking a little bit at Rianne there. 
No. <laughs> uh, one of the things I would say the last time I went that I noticed was from, say, 20 years ago when there was slightly more racial lines. It's because of the financial, which you touched on the commercial, you know, standard bikini and feathers is 500 quid. Right? Yeah. Bikini and a headdress. It's yeah. become financial lines more so than racial lines. Yeah. I've noticed yeah. that it's yeah. becoming because of the commercial. In the big bands, I yes, think. So yeah, that's quite an interesting. Okay, story. so there's a, there's that economic division, economic which is even, division, yeah, more so than racial. Yeah. Oh, sorry. In the, in my last posting, so to speak, in university terms, uh, there was a centre for carnival arts, mm -hmm. and they spend all their time um, raising money to make the costumes. But they they created um, a lot of workshops and held them around and about the town, and a lot of people engaged in that activity. Is there a similar sort of thing in here? That's that's, that's the question. The comment is. Um, maybe we should persuade the supermarkets to sell chickens with feathers on them and then people will realise where chickens came from. <laughs> but I think, I think uh, um, every year there is a struggle to find uh, the money that's for Leeds Carnival. Right. Um, but uh, but there, is, there, is, there are calls for volunteers, and it is a, you know, there, there, is, there, are, there are mass camps set up where people can come and volunteer and help build the costumes, put the costumes together. So there is a, a community, you know, activity. Um, um, but, um, but again, you know, there are continual financial restrictions on Carnival. Um, I don't know if Arthur France would like to comment further. Yeah, uh, it is a struggle, but one of the things that we try in Leeds, we've been very successful over the years is to keep the cost to the minimum, you know, down. Mm. Because what you don't want to do is to make kind of to commercial. Otherwise they will destroy the whole meaning of it. Mm. You know, I mean you know, like I would say down in Trinidad and if you look at Brazil. The sad thing is you know, look at Brazil kind of the people who the kind of meant to farm. You don't see them mm. because they're being priced out. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? Mm. It becomes just more It is. Mm. The, the good thing is, I think, one of the best things that we did from very early is to build a very strong relation with the city council mm. Mm. because they are your main sponsor. Yeah. Had you not, had you not been, had the foresight to make sure we build that. Link, strong link with the city council. Mm. You will find that you remember one year when London couldn't find money mm. and uh, let it come in. And once to, want to bring in the big spots would like to come in because it's cheap publicity for them. Mm. For them, who pay the price of college too. Because mm. mm. they put some demand on you and you cut the, the poor people out, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's something that we're very mindful of. But, you know, I mean, as life goes on, you have to progress. So, you know, so that people want to go, that you want to go to a nice, you're going to and find the best outfit. Mm. So when you design a costume, you've got to design the costume to capture a certain group of people yes. who will pay for them. Yes, yeah. And you get a band, you better than the other person, mm. but at the same time, controlling the price. Yes, yeah, so there's that constant tension very, yeah, yeah. Between, yeah. in terms of the commercialization of, of Carnival. Yes. And as I say, community, it's, it's, you should never ever take Carnival out of this comfort zone. It, it, it starts at belong and it should remain in that comfort zone and people in uh, welcome to come into the carnival centre and get involved and you know, mm. live with you don't yes, yes. ever try to take it out of this drive. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Arthur. Um, any other questions? Just, um, you should get slide from 8088 with the, um, just picking up on the last point you made about female trans. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What was the difference between the sort of Folly type figure in 1888 in the mm. London street, and, and, and these figures, isn't it just transgression or is there something additional? 
I think um, I think there's there's something additional in terms of it being a black female body that is uh, taking part in in carnival. So I think that you know, that the history of slavery um, and and then you know the black woman being able to to take to the streets and celebrate her body. You know, um, I think that that you know I think that that, that that's I think in that sense transgressing the image of the black female body as as something to be owned as something um, you know, as a reproductive. Uh, so the white figure from 1888 was in a sort of equally transgressive at the time when you couldn't see an animal. I think it's transgressive, absolutely, and it would have been transgressive in terms of the roles available for women at that particular time. Yes, yes. Yes. How is that? Um, you sort of condemned. I thought you condemned this sort of uh, contemporary scene slightly. Well, letting the other girl, I quite oh no, no, no! I wasn't condemning the contemporary scene. In fact, I think it's you know it's incredibly, incredibly celebratory. I think that it's very positive. I think that unfortunately, you know, as I said at the end, until until um, you know we can transgress the patriarchal structures of our society, that those the women on display, the spectacle of the women will, at, 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 in one sense, um, you know, transgress and break, break boundaries um, and be a celebration of emancipation, but also inevitably will feed into that idea of the woman's body as being something to be enjoyed by men in, for the male gaze. Wow, okay, so you, so in that case, it's the same as... Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> Is that clear at all? Yes, I'm okay. Honest. Thank you. I guess it's also about diversity too, isn't it? So the, the kind of diversity of the, the shapes of female bodies on display who perhaps don't all fit with conventional mm. you know, models of what's desirable or yes. um, in, in a patriarchal culture. Yeah. So as long as you know, no one's prevented from taking part because of mm -hmm. you know, the shape or, or the look of, of their body, mm -hmm. I think that diversity is, is an interesting aspect. Yes. Of the contemporary way the female body is appearing at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'll be at news and cigars because the question what's the difference? Why is the less, when you look at the German carnival, mm -hmm. contemporary carnival, uh, okay, so it's in February, and uh, you talked about weather, mm -hmm. uh, why, why, is the, why, is the, why has that remained? Pre Lent, <laughs> and this one. Well, I don't Should know. You just mentioned the word. Yes, yeah. And I, well, I, I don't know a huge amount about the German carnival, but I know well, here, yeah. as a street carnival, that it would have been, it wouldn't have been able to have that many people you know, take to the streets. So, Notting Hill and uh, Leeds Carnival both take place in the last oh. August bank holiday. Um, so, why not on Rosenmont? <laughs> Yeah. Just, just purely weather. Yeah. Well, as far as I'm aware. Okay. Yes. Could I say, uh, well, I mean, my senior let me say I feel like cool. And uh, we want to have fun. Mm -hmm. And we, we went for the back on Monday, but most of the time was serious. <coughs> and so the background to make sure that apart from what we just said, mm -hmm. the team and the media and everybody want to qualify. Mm -hmm. so, you know, so then yeah. in summer you have the holidays and you have the time and it, it's warm and that's what we went for. Yeah. I mean the German carnival and the sort of time we enjoy it and I mean you know we all dance and temperature fifteen we we, we lose even. <laughs> <laughs> Catholic traditions are not as strong. Yeah. Uh, we have Pancake Tuesday, which yeah. is 
not quite what nobody you remembers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Is there any reason it's dropped? If you, if you, if you look at the Rose and Montag again, the carnival, you know, they always have a, some sort of figure of the Angela Merkel now. Mm -hmm. um, why is the British carnival perhaps lost that political edge? You don't well, see I think, great figures of David Cameron. Really. Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I, 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 the Leeds carnival. Um, you know, has retained an element of that, you know, no, and as I showed, you know, in the Harrison Bundy troupe, that there is that, that vein of political satire um, that goes through the Leeds Carnival. Um, but I think, you know, people, I think inevitably, and as Carnival moves from one generation to another, people want to enjoy themselves, you know, there is a, perhaps that sense that we don't want to be continually, the younger generation don't want to be, you know, engaging necessarily with politics or even the historical past, but actually, you know, just have, be free to, to, to have a good time, to enjoy the moment. So I think there are those, those you know, there's that tension in Carnival where uh, perhaps more, the older generation would, would like to recall, to, at its core, would like Carnival to recall some of that history of, of struggle against, you know, oppressive forces, but whereas the, the younger uh, yeah. Members of Carnival, you know, want to, uh, you know, just want to sort of let their hair down. Yeah. So also, it's, it, it's um, become an art form rather than, you know, for a lot of people nowadays, rather than political and historical, mm -hmm. it's an art form in itself just to celebrate something creative. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the creative endeavour. In itself is 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 a part of the celebration. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I think the house money is a very important part of Canada. Oh, sorry, Alfred. Harrison Bundy. Harrison, yeah, Harrison Bundy. Because mm -hmm. it carries a message that needs to be people should not forget. Yeah. And so Harrison Bundy too for me is mm -hmm. always there. Yes. To remind you. Yeah. Now, me personally, my troops, I am very passionate about my African heritage. Mm, mm. Um, more, my costumes I like to bring out a message of, of Africa. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. people different. Yes, different troops will, troops will, will have will, a different yes. political slant. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you show the Dove morning, mm. you show the the difference between train and Jove and morning and England and mm. Jove and morning. Mm. Mm. The thing that leads, uh, we have to be careful that Jove and morning we don't miss the message of what it is mm. rather than people just coming out and having fun. In their pajamas, yes, yeah, yeah. Yes. Sorry, I was just going to say, in terms of sort of like the political edge of Carnival and not losing that. Mm. Um, I worked with a group um, in a troop for this year's carnival, mm -hmm. um, and both of the groups that I was working with, um, we had a real political edge underneath it and started looking at colonisation and, and new forms of colonisation in terms of capitalism and different stuff yes. like that. And mm -hmm. a range of young people from refugee backgrounds. Mm. Or was you, did you do the refugee uh, troop? Um, so there was Leeds Dynamics and Solidarity Youth that yes. were from refugee yeah. backgrounds. That was brilliant. Um, and, and we looked directly at that, and that's mm. young people aged from around 14 up to about 25. Mm -hmm. So I really don't think it necessarily always is losing its political edge. Mm. I agree with you wholeheartedly in terms of it's about the creative sensibilities as well, and those shouldn't be overlooked, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for you, you, young people are still playing a big role in, the, in yeah. that aspect of it. and I also think the politics is important mm. to young people. Yeah. Maybe not always, but yeah. I do think that there are some people that it makes an mm -hmm. aspect of yeah. it. Did you find with the young people that you worked with yeah. that the politics was as important to, the, to those that had been through, you know, sort of a turmoil, political turmoil, and to those who hadn't? Or? Um... I'd say it was more of a process, process of educational development. Mm. Um, so, for example, we did a lot of like participatory reading together. Mm. Um, so there was one book that we looked at called The King of Sugar and looking at the slave triangle itself and yes. looking at colonialism um, historically mm. um, <coughs> and then also relating that to more modern day terms of colonialism. And I think it was in the relating it to modern day terms that it that, became... That helped, yeah, 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 yeah to make more it uh, understandable and current, yeah.
Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Um, and check our website for our next event. And you probably will receive an email invite to that um, tomorrow. So thank you for coming, and let's thank you, Thank you.